We're uh, very privileged to have uh, Melissa Harris here from uh, CMS. Uh, she traveled here from Baltimore, and we're very grateful that uh, she was willing to come and speak to us on the CMS perspective uh, on the settings rule. Uh, Melissa is the Senior Policy Advisor for the Disabled and Elderly Health uh, Program Group. Uh, Melissa has been with CMS uh, since 1995, holding uh, various uh, positions. Um, and uh, we're very grateful to, for her to come, Melissa. Uh, and I, again, you've got cards on your table, so please uh, write out your questions. I'm sure you're going to have a lot for Melissa. She's got a preview of <laughs> what's on folks' minds. Uh, and please welcome Melissa Harris. Hi, good morning. Um, so uh, I am Melissa, I'm here from CMS, um, from the federal government, and I'm here to help. Um, and uh, I, I hope you believe me when I say that I am happy to be here uh, with you. Um, and uh, you know, I normally do not use a lot of notes in my presentations, I, I'm more of a free form kind of girl, but today, um, 10 pages of notes for this uh, conversation. Double-spaced, so, so don't panic. Um, but there are several specific points that I want to make, and I was taking notes during the last session, and I, I do want to make a, a, a couple of points uh, in response to, um, uh, to what you just heard. But um, I actually found that presentation quite balanced, very accurate, you know, so I just, I just uh, want to give you a couple of uh, points of clarification on a couple of pieces. Um, you know, I have some slides, but I think I am going to use them more as a backdrop than uh, a formal guide um, to my presentation. So I'm going to um, kind of toggle back and forth between the actual settings criteria for part of it, and then we'll get into some of the more uh, administrative pieces. Um, but I do, and many of you may recognize these slides, I used them at the Home and Community Based Services Conference in Baltimore uh, a couple of months ago, and they've been used over time the last several years, so there's not a ton of new information here, so that's another reason that I don't really want to focus on them. But uh, I do have a couple of goals for the session. Um, I'd like to spend some time talking about the regulation itself, how we got to the place of issuing the regulation, and how the differing viewpoints that people bring to the table were taken into account to, um, uh, to build the regulatory structure. And then we will go a little bit deep into the, the specific issue that I imagine is, is uh, clearly on your minds around heightened scrutiny. Uh, and in um, settings that are presumed to have the qualities of an institution. And here again, we'll talk about the differing viewpoints and where we are right now and where CMS sees us going. Um, and then I'm interested in hearing from you. Uh, I, uh, I want to hear what your concerns are. I may know some of them, I may not. And my goal in the question and answer session is either to have an answer for you or to take your question back or concern back to my colleagues at CMS, and um, then we'll go from there. But to the extent I can demystify any portions of the regulation or um, clarify federal versus state uh, implementation decisions or uh, help you see uh, my point of view and me understand your point of view, then, then I will think today is a raging success. And uh, as we were talking internally at CMS about whether to accept the invitation to be here, it was really an easy yes. Um, and uh, I, um, I met uh, several folks from Together for Choice at this last HCBS conference, and the questions they asked were relevant. And it's really very important for CMS to be able to have conversations with all of our stakeholders, and that includes you. And so I'm, uh, I'm very glad for this opportunity. I hope, um, check back with me in about an hour and see if I'm equally as glad um, for this opportunity. But, uh, but for right now, um, you know, I, I really quite appreciate being here. So let's take a step back and talk about the statutory construct and how we got here. Uh, you heard um, correct information just now about the kind of trilogy of 
um, the different kinds of um, documents that are in our world. Uh, we do start with the statute passed by Congress. Um, that is found in section, uh, or Title 19 of the Social Security Act. And Title 19 gives us our direction statutorily on things from the services that states have to cover under Medicaid, services that states can choose to cover under Medicaid but don't have to, the various populations that can receive services in Medicaid. Some populations are mandatory, some are optional. Uh, it gives us some specifications for managed care provisions, for payment um, uh, infrastructure to providers, some quality uh, assurance frameworks. It's quite comprehensive. Uh, it's not really for the faint of heart or a quick read, um, but it is, and it's been modified over time, so there are many layers, some dating all the way back to the program's advent in 1965, some that uh, were just added to the Medicaid framework a couple of weeks ago with the passage of uh, opioid-focused legislation. And so all of that comes together to form the statutory framework um, that gives CMS our marching orders for how the program is to be implemented. But what you heard from Chris and Phil is correct. There are sometimes very high-level requirements specified in statute that then the regulatory agency, in this case CMS, needs to flesh out a bit uh, to be a little more operational, a little more policy-driven. And that's where a regulation can come in and in some cases even something below that or sub-regulatory guidance. It's a little more art than science in determining what is appropriate for a regulation versus uh, a letter, for example, to the state Medicaid directors, something else that we have available to us called an informational bulletin. So it really does um, take a, a bit of analysis on our part to figure out what's going to go in the regulation, what's going to go in sub-regulatory guidance. Um, and so, you know, we do our best to make sure that everyone understands how a particular piece of guidance CMS is putting out intersects with each other and intersects with the statute. But, you know, some, sometimes that can get lost in, in all the details. And there comes a point when, at the federal level, CMS needs to say, we're not going to issue any more guidance. There are sometimes requests for a CMS statement on some kind of operational issue. Sometimes that's warranted, other times we really feel like we're migrating into state territory to make some of those decisions. And so there does come a point when we say we're done at the federal level making any kind of guidance statements. The rest then is up to the states and the provider community and the stakeholder community to come together more at local levels and, and, and figure out uh, an implementation flavor. So uh, to go back to statute, 1915C, uh, in the Social Security Act was added in the early 1980s. And it was really seen as Medicaid's foray into providing long-term care services as an alternative to institutions. When the Medicaid Act was first formed, we had hospitals, nursing facilities, and intermediate care facilities. And that was Medicaid's um, participation in long-term care service provision. But in the early 1980s, there was this um, uh, development of this waiver authority for individuals who otherwise would have been served in communities and the benefit package that could be served in the waivers uh, was really quite broad and states since then have really be, been attracted to those waivers because of the variety of services that can be authorized because of some of the flexibilities you heard about um, states can decide to offer a waiver in a dedicated geographic area uh, a state could put an enrollment cap on a waiver, and so there's a lot of flexibilities that bolster a state's ability to, to be able to quantify their fiscal impact of providing long-term services and supports. One of the requirements in the 1915C statute is that services be provided in a home and community-based setting. Like I said, this was really made as an alternative to institutionalization, and so the theory was that the services needed to be provided in ways that were inherently different from uh, the, the provision of services in an institution. And before this regulation, though, uh, there was no standard definition of what a home and community-based setting meant. And one of the, the hallmarks of Medicaid is that each program is so different across the states, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And so it won't surprise you to learn that absent any kind of federal statement about what a home and community-based setting was, there was enormous variation across the states at the locations and the, the types of environments in which 
home and community-based services were being provided and billed to the federal government as a home and community-based service. And over time, there were additions made to the Medicaid menu uh, under the rubric of home and community-based services, and these were outside of the 1915C waiver statute. These were more in the state plan. And you heard Chris and Phil mention some differences about the state plan and the waiver authorities. The, the Medicaid state plan is essentially the contract between CMS and the state for how that state's going to run its Medicaid program. So every state has one. It describes the services that are going to be provided to Medicaid beneficiaries in that state, who is eligible for Medicaid in that state, how the providers in that state are going to be reimbursed, what kind of managed care delivery system is on the scene. So every state's document is quite different and is, is customized to that state. And the state will submit to CMS content for that state plan. Uh, and any time a state wants to amend their state plan, they would submit a state plan amendment to CMS. And that's the, the, one of the fundamental books of business that CMS does, is, is engage with states in reviewing their state plan amendments. And so there are um, some, of the, some of the core services in Medicaid are found in one particular section of the Social Security Act, and that's section 1905A. I want you to hang with me. It's going to get a little more interesting from here. This is, this is like a vegetable soup or an alphabet soup uh, kind of deal, but it, it'll get a little more um, uh, engaging in a minute. And so you've got, um, you got 1905A services, which include your hospital services. This is where the nursing facility services are authorized, home health, you have personal care, case management, uh, preventive services, all, all very broad coverage categories. And then you have some of the waiver categories like the 1915C, which allows you to authorize some services outside of the state plan and give states a little more of that um, uh, flexibility to do some targeting. What some amendments to Title 19 have done over time are build up the framework within the state plan for offering home and community-based services. In 2005, uh, Congress added the 1915I section to the Social Security Act, which essentially replicates what states can do under the 1915C waivers, but does not require individuals to meet an institutional level of care. Individuals need to be uh, less, uh, have less um, significant service needs to qualify uh, for those types of services. And then in 2010, in the Affordable Care Act, Congress added a community first choice state plan amendment, which also allows for the provision of uh, personal care services, home and community-based attendant services. Both the 1915I and the 1915K include congressional mandates that the services be provided in a home and community-based setting. Uh, and so it's taken on a little more importance as time has passed to have some sort of statement about what a home and community-based service is. More and more beneficiaries are receiving services authorized by those three coverage categories, and the role of home and community-based services in maintaining individual autonomy and community integration uh, has also uh, increased. So meanwhile, CMS was taking steps to solicit public input on what a home and community-based setting was. Typically, we issue what's called a notice of proposed rulemaking, saying this is what we're thinking about. Send us comments on whether we've hit the mark or, or need to, to rethink a particular thing, and then we issue a final rule. In this case, we took a step back and issued something that we don't normally do, which is called an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, which basically said, we're thinking about issuing regulatory direction on a home and community-based criteria, help us get started. So we collected public comment, used that to inform the construction of a proposed rule, published that and said, okay, here's what we got from your public comments, comment on this to, see if, to tell us if we're on the right track, solicited comments again, and that's what became the final regulation that was published in January of 2014. There were a lot of components of that regulation. The criteria of a home and community-based setting is just one of them. Uh, but the, the criteria were such that um, there needed to be a transition period attached to them because we knew that some time needed to, uh, to pass. So uh, a lot of the conversations between states and providers and beneficiaries, families, and CMS could take place uh, without any kind of uh, time pressure associated with them. Uh, it was clear from the public comments that different providers were going to need to make different um, types of changes, different scopes of changes, and so we did not want 
uh, the, the key variable there to be speed rather than uh, thought behind uh, those changes. And so initially, the um, transition period was for five years, meaning that it would have expired in March of 2019, which is in a few months. One of the early uh, things this current administration did was to extend that a little bit. And so now the transition period runs through March of 2022. Um, so we are still in the transition period. Uh, to, uh, to put a period on one of the uh, earlier questions, uh, we have not disallowed any uh, home and community-based settings or ruled any existing home and community-based setting not compliant with the regulation and uh, held withheld money uh, because the transition period is, a, is kind of a layer of protection uh, over existing uh, settings between now and 2022 to allow that federal funding to continue flowing as the states are making their assessments, providers are doing their self-assessments, figuring out what kinds of changes need to happen. There was a setting in North Dakota specifically that CMS went out and, and visited, um, and the results were a little bit of a mixed bag. Some, uh, some pieces of the, the setting were quite um, compliant with the reg. Some had a little more work to do, but in no case was, uh, was money taken back because we are in that, uh, this uh, period of transition. So uh, the criteria of a home and community-based setting was born, and I imagine that you all are, are very familiar with that. And so I've got a couple slides here that, uh, that walk through it, and so I'll, I'll switch back and forth um, between those. Um, it's a couple of different categories of criteria. One uh, is a set of criteria that really applies to anyone receiving home and community-based services funded under Medicaid, regardless of the setting uh, that they're in. And so that category of criteria includes things like uh, having opportunities to seek competitive integrated employment, uh, giving the individual uh, the ability to make um, personal choices, control their personal resources, make decisions about how they want to engage in their community, um, ensuring rights of dignity, respect, privacy, um, being free from coercion and restraint. Uh, and, uh, and the settings basically are to assure that beneficiaries can receive services in the same way that individuals not receiving Medicaid-funded home and community-based services can receive them. And then there are uh, other criteria, uh, additional criteria, when we're talking about a provider-owned or controlled residential setting. So here we could be talking about a group home, we could be talking about an intentional community, all sorts of variations on that theme. The, these types of criteria, as you heard a little bit ago, include things like being able to lock your doors, having access to food at any time, being able to welcome visitors at any time, being able to decorate your own space, having a lease or other kind of written protection that conveys some sort of tenancy rights that are comparable to what individuals in, in that geographic area enjoy outside of, of Medicaid-funded HCBS. And in some ways, um, you know, in some ways, these criteria are quite basic. Uh, and in other ways, um, you know, the, the conversations that we've had with states and providers and stakeholders speak to the need to implement some changes so providers can be compliant with those requirements. And so that means that today, Medicaid-funded uh, services are being provided to people in ways that don't necessarily support them in making the kinds of decisions that you and I make without even realizing we're making a decision. All of the decisions we've made today, uh, what to have for breakfast, when to have breakfast, uh, with whom to associate, uh, how to get here, what modes of, of transportation to use, uh, whether I wanted to come here, whether I wanted to go somewhere else, all of those decisions we made without even realizing it, and the goal of this regulation and the settings criteria is to facilitate individuals receiving Medicaid-funded home and community-based services to make those same decisions and to make sure that, sure that the right services and supports are there to assist them in doing that. Uh, okay. So one of the biggest challenges um, as you are setting any kind of home and community-based service policy at a state level, at a national level, is that there is a huge amount of variation across the spectrum of individuals receiving Medicaid-funded home and community-based services. Uh, we're talking about individuals at literally every point in the lifespan. Uh, for example, we have individuals who are very young who have been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. 
among that population alone, there's an enormous amount of variation in terms of the services and supports they need. You have younger adults with a disability, be it a physical disability, developmental disability, cognitive, traumatic brain injury, whatever. And then you have older adults, uh, many of whom do not really consider themselves to be disabled, but still need some services and supports in order for them to live independent uh, lives. And so how do you establish criteria that's going to apply to all of those people uh, in ways that, that takes their, their various goals uh, into account? And the answer is you don't. Uh, it's, it's not possible to do that. And so even though the, uh, even though the criteria present uh, a bit of a standardization uh, in the, the criteria of a home and community-based setting, they cannot be applied in the same way to individuals because everybody is bringing such a different array of goals and preferences and needs to the table. And so even as we were sitting in Baltimore reviewing the thousands, literally thousands, of public comments that we had received over the, the couple of um, solicitations of public comment, we all tend to, to have individual people in our minds as we're doing this. We all have families and friends and loved ones who have some sort of engagement with the, the long-term care system, and yet it was dangerous to have one specific person in our mind as we were writing this regulation uh, because it couldn't just apply to meet the needs of one person. It had to apply across the board to meet the needs of millions of individuals who are receiving Medicaid-funded home and community-based services. And so while there is a bit of standardization here, uh, there, is, uh, there are key flexibilities in the reg to acknowledge and recognize and respect that everyone is bringing something different to the table in terms of how Medicaid home and community-based services need to be meeting their goals. Uh, and, and what that flexibility is, uh, is, um, is the construct of the person-centered plan or the concept of the person-centered plan. And I cannot stress this concept enough. It is really the cornerstone of the regulation, but more importantly, it is really the key element that is, uh, is responsive and respectful of individuals' different needs. And if that's not working, then, then the whole approach to the provision of person-centered home and community-based services uh, is in danger of, uh, of not being as robust as possible. So the person-centered plan, uh, and there's a lot in the regulation that, that describes the content of it, how it is to be established, who's supposed to be involved in it. It's a, it's a big deal, and it's a shift in thinking for some people, and so we recognize that. And there's been a little bit of guidance put out by CMS on person-centered planning. There is more to come. Uh, and I'm not sure we'll ever be completely finished with, uh, with issuing guidance on person-centered planning because the thinking in the field evolves and the, the need for best practices and some other um, uh, suggestions on how to really accomplish the goals of person-centered planning I think will, will always be changing. But the person-centered plan is the vehicle referenced in the regulation uh, for describing any modifications. And I put the word modifications in quotes because that is the word the regulation uses. Uh, there, there can be and should be modifications to the home and community-based settings criteria based on an individual's needs, preferences, and circumstances. And so uh, these couple of slides uh, talk about um, some of the regulatory provisions associated with um, describing a modification in someone's plan. Um, some of you might think these are a little onerous. I get that. Um, the, the goal was not to drown anyone in paperwork. Um, the goal is to really make sure that to the extent a provision of the home and community-based settings criteria is being modified, it's being done based on an individual's assessed need, that it's not some blanket modification that happens to apply to everyone receiving services in a particular setting, because chances are not everyone is going to need the same modifications. Even if your setting is providing services to someone with a similar diagnosis, like Alzheimer's, dementia, Every individual is different in where they are uh, in their treatment uh, or in their uh, disease progresses, and the, the needs and supports are going to be different. And so the, the key behind all of this documentation requirements is to drive that point home that this should be an individual assessment of what an individual's services and supports needs are and individualized modifications of the home and community-based uh, uh, setting criteria. 
So you may be looking at the settings criteria and thinking, I don't even know how to apply this to my whoever, uh, my son with profound developmental disabilities or my spouse with dementia or my uh, sibling who is in a wheelchair or my clients with a particular disorder like PICA. Uh, and you may be thinking that this uh, home and community-based settings criteria was really designed for people other than those you serve or for people who are more able to self-advocate for themselves or who need a lesser amount of services and supports. And this is where I want to challenge your thinking a little bit. Um, and I want you to, again, stay with me um, because one thing you are not going to hear from me and you should not be hearing from anyone in the federal government associated with implement implementing this rule is that we know better than you do about what a particular person needs. The truth is, as, as well-meaning as we are, and as much time as we spent poring over the public comments that we got on this regulation, we are not walking a mile in anyone else's shoes. And, and we don't know what it is like to provide services and supports for the people that you are providing them to. We don't know what it is like to be uh, having spent years caring for a particular family member or friend. And so it is not our place to say, It is, it's not our place to say they should be living like this, okay? I, I really want, if, if nothing else is a takeaway from this conversation, I, I, really want, I really want this point to be heard. The goal of this regulation is not to say this is how people should be living. And I, and I really did appreciate hearing from Phil and Chris that there is no um, expectation of forced integration. I'm actually quite surprised at how many times I need to say that. And, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. I don't know if it's a fear or if it's what you're, you're, um, you're taking away from some other implementation documents that, were, that you're seeing. Uh, there is no singular definition of success for this regulation. Success is not um, uh, derived from someone being kicked out of a residential setting at 9 o'clock in the morning and being allowed back in at 5.30 in the afternoon. Um, you know, success is not uh, uh, declared by somebody going to a non-residential setting and doing work they find mindless and not rewarding um, just, just because they're not in their residential setting. Success is not declared, you know, if somebody is kind of thrown into the community and, and, and told, you know, you're now integrated and you're welcome. Um, the, the services and supports need to be there for these individuals to, to meet their goals, and it's in that person-centered planning document in which those goals are going to be uh, articulated. And so while we should not be doing that uh, as the federal government, um, you know, like I said, we're here to help, uh, but we don't know better. What we do know and what we should be doing and what we have been doing, I hope, and I, I hope we continue doing it, is asking everyone um, who thinks this regulation is here to take away choice to really look at the settings criteria, and I mean really take a look at it with an eye toward understanding that while it might necessitate making changes to a particular model of operation, those, A, those, those changes are to comply with settings criteria that are achievable, and the role of the person-centered plan uh, is to have conversations that might illuminate goals and preferences and service needs that you weren't aware of, no matter how close you are to someone. Just as my interests and goals have changed as I've aged, as my thoughts and priorities have changed, uh, individuals that you've, been know that you've known for your whole life or their whole life or maybe have been providing services to for decades, they are changing and evolving just as we are. And that kind of regular touch point as the person-centered plan is developed and reviewed and modified is the real chance to say, what is missing from your life? Is there anything missing from your life? If the answer is no, that's great. Uh, as, as Phil and Chris said, you know, if somebody wants to live a life where they take comfort in a routine, if they take comfort in where they go and, uh, and who they associate with by keeping those parameters small, that's great. There's nothing in the regulation that says you have to change the way you live. The goal is to say if you want to be doing something you're not, if you want to pursue employment, you should be given the services and supports to help facilitate that goal. Um, if you want to 
um, you know, be doing something um, that's different from what you're doing or receiving services in a different way. The person-centered plan is your ability to do that. And maybe the goals are not anything to do with employment. We, we, I, I truly like to think that we do not have unrealistic expectations in this. We don't assume that the person-centered plan for every older adult will include a goal of competitive integrated employment. A lot of older adults have been there and done that. But should we assume that no older adult wants to attain competitive integrated employment? No. So the goal might be that. It could be, I want to learn how to take public transportation by myself so I can go to the grocery store and do my own food shopping. Or I've got a cousin that lives 20 miles away, but I haven't been to his house in years. I want the supports to go visit my cousin. Again, these are decisions that you and I make all the time, uh, but we don't necessarily need other people to help us accomplish those goals. And that's the role of the person-centered plan, that's the role of the settings criteria, is to illuminate those goals, give individuals the freedoms that they need to be making the decisions that will be rewarding for them and, and living their, their best life. We don't have any um, expectations of what their lives will be. That's up to them, and it's up to the people who are at the table as the person-centered plan is being developed. Um, but it really should be up to them, not up to the model of services that a particular provider provides uh, or an individual agreeing to live like this because they agree to receive services from a particular provider. That's what the home and community-based setting criteria is really um, designed to do. Uh, okay. And so, you know, just as we don't expect everyone to want the same things in life or to need the same supports to accomplish them. We also need to make sure that the millions of people who are receiving home and community-based services are supported to grow and thrive. And to do that, we did find the need to bring some standardization to the table, to say these are our basic expectations. Not that they need to be uh, done in the same way for everyone. We've already talked about the, the, the ability to modify those. But these are the decisions and the um, independence that we truly believe a Medicaid-funded provider of home and community-based services needs to be doing. And so what that entails for providers to the extent there are changes necessary, it's introducing a little more nimbleness. And anybody who's heard me speak before may have heard me use the word um, nimble before. And that's not meant to elicit fear or uncertainty or subjectivity. It's really just like a one word catch all to recognize that individuals are looking at you to provide services in different ways to them. Your services are going to play different roles in accomplishing their individual goals. And so how one person receives your services is going to be different from how another person receives your services. It doesn't mean you have to provide a whole host of different services. You are uh, under contract as Medicaid providers with the state to provide a menu of home and community-based services. We understand that. Uh, and there are realities about what's in that package of services that you're getting reimbursed from the state and what's not. And so this is not meant to say you know, you're now on the hook for everything, and you are now the sole arbiter of how an individual experiences autonomy and experiences community integration. But again, we go back to the person-centered plan, uh, you know, how, um, how that plan lays out what you're providing, what other providers are providing, what natural supports are providing. Oh, no. Okay. I'm on page, oh, Lord, I'm on page six of ten. I'm going to speed up. Um, okay. Um, so... We are going to seg now into heightened scrutiny because I know uh, that's, that's on the minds of a lot of you. Um, and so um, heightened scrutiny, again, is uh, the whole concept of presumptively institutional providers. And so how did we get there? Um, we had, um, uh, it was quite clear to us that there are some settings uh, that are not home and community based by default. Those are your institutional settings. Uh, and there were, it also became clear as we were looking through comments um, that there were a couple of schools of thought. Uh, one, one school is that uh, if a setting is chosen by an individual, it by default is home and community based and should be funded as such. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, the other school of thought is that there are some settings that are so inextricably linked to an institution that they should never be considered 
home and community-based, even though they're not directly funded uh, as an institution and may today be receiving funding as a home and community-based provider. And so you see that those two schools of thought are diametrically opposed, and everyone believes their position with the same passion. And so whatever position you bring to the table and whatever strength and vigor you you bring to that position, someone is having the exact opposite reaction and bringing that same passion to the table. And everyone is looking at CMS to, to make their vision and their, their priorities real. And so how do you do that? Uh, and so we did that uh, by coming to a compromise position in the regulation that said, aside from institutions, there really are no settings that are absolutely not home and community-based settings. But there are three categories of settings that are presumed to have the qualities of an institution, the presumption of which can be overcome by a special look uh, by the state and by CMS. And quickly, um, those types of settings are uh, settings on the grounds of or adjacent to a public institution. So for that, we might be talking about a cottage on the grounds of an ICF, a, build, uh, a setting that is inside a public or private institutional provider. So here it could be a, an assisted living wing of a nursing home, an adult day uh, wing of a nursing home. And then the gorilla in the room, uh, the, a setting that could isolate uh, HCBS beneficiaries from non-HCBS beneficiaries. And so we did that. And uh, we um, talked about uh, you know, what, what each types of, uh, of those settings were. But I want to take a step back and, enjoy, and address the choice argument because uh, we are on the same side. I don't know if you believe me, but I believe me, that, that we are on the, the same side about respecting an individual's choice. But let's be clear, an individual can choose to receive services in an institution. That's a legitimate service that gets Medicaid funding. Those coverage categories are not going away. Those are mandatory benefits. At least the nursing home or the um, uh, nursing home and the hospital are mandatory benefits. ICF uh, is optional. Um, and so I could choose to have, assuming I meet my state's level of care requirements, I could choose to receive services in a nursing facility. That nursing facility does not, by my choice, make it a home and community-based setting. It doesn't. I'm living in an institution. We want individuals in an institution to have the very best care. They are people, they're Medicaid beneficiaries, there's well over a million of them. They deserve the very best care, and to the extent they find community in that institution, all the better. But that doesn't make it a home and community-based location just because I chose it. There, there need to be, since all of these home and community-based authorities that I've talked about are optional, states don't have to provide any of them. All states do because they recognize that, by and large, people want to be in their homes and communities. They want to be independent, and they're, it's typically cheaper. So all states offer some array of home and community-based services, but it means that there are always funding concerns, there are always limited resources, and so as we are reimbursing for home and community-based services with a limited pool of money, we need to make sure that those services are meeting the needs and expectations of the people who sometimes are waiting years to access them. There are waiting lists, particularly for people with an intellectual or developmental disability, in waivers across the country that's allowed under, our, under the statute. And people are making the choice, for whatever reason, to sometimes wait for years to access those services because they'd rather be receiving services in a home and community-based setting. And that needs to mean something, hence back to the uh, criteria. So we've got these three categories of presumptively institutional setting, and we did issue some guidance a couple of years ago to give states some context uh, for what we meant by an isolating setting uh, and heard about it a lot. Uh, from uh, a lot of audiences, and, and many of you who have expressed your opinions to CMS in the past are probably sitting here. Um, and I, I gotta tell you, before, before I really got neck deep into looking at the comments associated with this regulation and spending my professional life dedicated largely to implementing this reg, I had not heard of an intentional community before, I'll, I'll be honest with you. And clearly, one is one, you know, there's no need to paint a broad brush against uh, an entire industry. And so one of the things that you will see us doing in this new heightened scrutiny guidance that you've heard us talking about for months, 
uh, is that we will be walking away from specific examples of what an isolating setting looks like. Uh, and basically allowing all settings to be on equal footing as they're having conversations with the states. One of, we will also be making some minor modifications to the criteria of an isolating setting. And what you heard from Chris and uh, Phil is exactly right. Isolation gets back to the lack of opportunities. It is not you know, that, that people can't choose to, to stay on a campus setting, on an intentional community. Some of the best days of my life were spent on my college campus. There's nothing inherently wrong you know, with, a, with the campus setting. But the more you have things co-located, the bigger it gets, and the bigger it gets, the more you have to really work to make sure that you are meeting the needs of each individual. Can it be done? It can be done. Might it require some work? It might. It probably will. Um, but it's my job and our job to give you the tools you need to make that work happen. The goal is not to have a crisis of lack of access to home and community-based providers at the end of the transition period. That's not in anybody's definition of success uh, with this regulation. Um, the goal is to make sure that people have the choice of alternatives to institutions, choices that meet their needs in terms of the model of service provision, in terms of how they are supported in, um, uh, in meeting their community integration needs. Uh, do I think that a presumptively institutional setting can comply with the settings criteria? I absolutely do. Um, can all of them do it? That's, that's not up to me. That's largely up uh, to you all. But the standard is the same. And so whether heightened scrutiny is in your future, whether it's in my future, the goal is the same, to adhere to the settings criteria. And that's why I've spent so much time on it in this conversation rather than you know, doing such a deep dive into the, into the heightened scrutiny. If you meet the settings criteria, then you, know, you, are, um, you, know, you are in it. I do wanna to close talking about states um, though because they, um, to my knowledge, are not here, um, but they are another decision maker that you very much need to be aware of. Um, you know, they will make the first cut at determining whether your setting falls into any of the three categories of being presumptively institutional, and they will also make the first determination about whether your setting, if it does um, fall into any of those categories, uh, overcomes that presumption. If the state says, yes, you fall into one of those categories, yes, you overcome the institutional presumption, that uh, package of information will come to CMS. If a state says, no, you don't overcome the presumption, that's where the conversation ends. Can you come to CMS to say you disagree with the state? Sure, I mean, you can approach us you know, at any time. Uh, are we going to intervene and say to a state, you need to change your mind on a particular setting? I, I don't see that happening. States are our partners in administering the, the Medicaid program and, and this as well. So it's very worth your time to understand your state's implementation strategy for the regulation, whether they have any designs on changing the provider mix that's, uh, that's uh, on the scene providing uh, HCBS. Um, and uh, and they, um, you know, they, they should be a necessary stop on your um, conversations. Um, so I'm gonna close with two things. One, you have to adhere to the regular, regulatory criteria. That, that's an absolute. Number two, you can adhere to the regulatory criteria. Um, it's, it's our job to help you get there. So I invite all of us to, you know, to, to do our best to get there together. Um, so with that, uh, and uh, only moderate trepidation for what's gonna come at me for questions and answers, and um, a sincere thank you for the invitation to speak, uh, I will stop, thanks. So um, you did generate a few questions. Um, first one is, doesn't the settings rule take away an individual's or their guardian's freedom to choose the setting that's most suitable for their family member? So, so that's kind of a final jeopardy question. I mean, it's, it's you know, the, the crux of a lot of the concerns. And um, I, my answer is it does not, or it, it should not. 
um, because again, the goal is not to whittle down the availability of compliant providers. The goal is to assist providers in making any necessary changes so they can adhere to the settings criteria. It is worth saying, and, and uh, a spin on this question was asked in the, in the last session, because of the statutory construct, there are three authorities that require services to be provided in a home and community-based setting. That's three authorities out of the myriad of coverage authorities. A, a lot of home and community-based services are authorized under the three authorities that do require a home and community-based setting. Not all of them are. Some of them can be um, authorized under the 1905A coverage categories that don't require services uh, to be provided in a home and community-based setting. Um, so there are options for a setting who does not want to make the changes to comply uh, with the regulation, who cannot make the changes. There are options that the state can think about. They're all, uh, they all have pros and cons. Um, but it's, it's worth knowing that not every Medicaid authority requires services to be provided in a home and community-based setting. For the ones that do, uh, the goal is, again, to um, make sure that the setting is delivering services in such a way that the person-centered plan is, and the individual's goals and preferences are really at the forefront rather than a singular model of care. That in no way is meant to say, we don't think a particular industry can and should be part of the provider landscape after the, the transition period. There are enough people with different needs and different opinions as to what kind of service model is best going to meet their needs for everyone who is in business today. Uh, whether it's an intentional community, a group home, some new evolving models that are um, uh, talking about shared living arrangements, having multi-generational, multi-needs individuals sharing the same, uh, the, 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 the same physical space. There's all kinds of evolution, but there's enough people with enough different needs to, uh, to warrant all of these existing models. The goal is to just look at the settings criteria, see how you can attain it, what you meet today, what you might need to, to change to meet it, and then there's no reason why uh, anyone's choice should be limited on uh, whether to, to continue to receive your services after the transition period. Does CMS give special consideration to third-party advocacy groups such as the ARC when developing regulations? If so, why is that voice more important than that of parents and the individuals themselves? So, like I said earlier, I, I would hope that uh, not only in the regulation, but in the guidance that comes out, all of you, and when I say all of you, I don't mean just everyone in this room, but everyone who considers themselves an HCBS stakeholder, and there's bazillions of you, can see your priori where in the, in the guidance your priorities were taken into account and reflected explicitly, and the areas where you can see that we went a different way. And so we, we don't expect any singular stakeholder to say, I, you know, they nailed it for me, or I lost everything that I held dear. Uh, in the implementation of this reg. There's no you know, real winners and losers in there. I, I hope everyone is a little bit happy and everyone is a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have to, to give a little bit on that. But again, for every parent who comes to us to say, I need my child to remain in their provider setting where they've been and that setting should not have to make any changes, there is another parent who says, I can't find a provider who supports my child to engage in the community the way he wants. And so that's, that's what all of us need to, to recognize is that, is that, like I said, every position has people on opposite sides who feel just as passionately about it. And so the goal of the reg was not to cater to any one organization, be it an advocate, a state, a provider. Uh, it's, it's really to say this is how we all have to come together because the lift is big enough for all of us to need to take a corner uh, and so the, the conversations that need to be happening at the state level, um, and some states are better than others at doing this, I will, I will freely admit, is to say this is my state level footprint for how I want to uh, 
to comply with the regulation, let me hear from you, my providers, my stakeholder community, about the things that are the most important to you, the questions you have, how we can best engage with CMS. To the extent that's not happening, there is time left in the, uh, in the transition period, and you have a ready conduit into CMS in the form of me, um, where you can share any concerns about what you perceive as a lack of stakeholder engagement. It's, it's cannot, the, the criticalness of that engagement cannot be overstated um, because none of the conversations or none of the decisions that are coming out of CMS or coming out of the states as we implement this regulation are academic. They, they impact people. And so all the, the right people need to, to, uh, to be at the table. <clears throat> Is it assumed that a state will submit all category four sites to CMS for heightened scrutiny if not, what happens to that site? And you might want to explain what a category four site is. I'm actually not sure what category four <coughs> is. There's, there's three types of settings uh, that are presumed institutional, and the third category is the category that could be isolating to individuals. So I will answer this question from that vantage point. If that's not correct, you, know, you can come find me uh, afterwards. Um, so the state is going to make the first cut. The state is, is doing their assessment uh, of all of their providers. Um, to determine which of them um, fall into any of the three categories of being presumptively institutional. And let's say you're in a provider entity that the state says, yes, you meet the, the criteria of an isolating provider, um, but you know, I, I'm going to assess you and make a final determination, but you know, your setting will require heightened scrutiny. It's a, it's a, uh, it could go one of two ways. The state could say, the state should be meeting with you and saying, you know, your setting has been identified as, as being presumptively institutional, regardless of uh, any of the three categories, wh whichever category it falls into. Here's how we can go forward. You know, if, if you and we, meaning you the provider, we the state, um, you know, come to consensus that there are changes that the provider is willing to make and can make by the end of the transition period, the state will most likely say, I think you can overcome your presumption of being uh, institutional. And so I will work with CMS to outline all the modifications that you're going to make or remediations you're going to make between now and the end of the transition period such that you will be in compliance. And so then I'm going to, you know, lob that package over to CMS and they will review it um, to, to see if they agree with us. And when I say see if they agree with us, you know, that's, that's, uh, that sounds weird sometimes. I mean, the, the goal, there will be, um, to, to be frank, there will be quite a bit of deference to states as they are submitting packages over to us. The goal is not to, <coughs> to say to a state, convince me that a setting overcomes its institutional presumption. If the state says it does, that will be given a lot of deference. It's not absolute deference. Uh, you know, if the, if the state uh, sends us information that really does not demonstrate how the criteria of a home and community-based setting are met, we're going to have questions. It doesn't mean that it's an immediate no or the state's request is denied. It means most, most likely we will have questions back for the state to say, here are some gaps we're seeing in what you sent us and, uh, you know, being able to confirm that the setting meets the settings criteria. So the goal is not to, to meet each state submission with arms crossed presupposing that the decision is either a yes or a no. It really is a case-by-case -case look. But if the state is assessing you as a provider and saying, I think you meet one of these three categories of presumptively institutional, and I don't think you can overcome this presumption, or I am looking to take my provision of home and community-based services in a different way, um, then, then that state decision will stand. And, uh, and like I said, uh, CMS is, does not typically um, uh, step in to second guess uh, decision by the state to not send a package forward. And so what happens if the state decides that a presumption of being institutional will stand is that something, something needs to happen by the end of the transition period. Um, either the state looks for non-Medicaid funding who knows how likely that is, probably not excessively likely, but that's an option on the table. Um, the state can look for other Medicaid authorities that don't require services uh, to, to be um, in a home and community-based setting. Uh, the, or the, the, um, uh, the provider can decide not to be in Medicaid anymore. Uh, that's easier said than done, and, and uh, to the extent there's already a payer mix <coughs> Uh, in that provider uh, such that Medicaid is not the lion's share of reimbursement, that might be more, more feasible than others. 
Um, as, a, as a last resort, you know, the, the provider can, um, can transition individuals receiving services from them to other, um, to other providers who are compliant for purposes of Medicaid funding. So it's very much going to depend on the circumstances. It could be that you and the state say, I can make changes to bring myself into compliance by the end of the transition period, and then time passes, and the remediations are a little more than you expected, and then you were coming to the end of the transition period, and it's not clear that those remediations will be done uh, in time for you to be compliant by the end of the transition period. Those, those conversations um, will not be easy, and no one is really looking forward to them. What happens as a result of those conversations will be very case-specific. It's one of the reasons that uh, we ask the states to be thinking about, to the extent there are providers who will not be compliant by the end of the transition period, how they will be working with individuals receiving services from them, what is the cutoff date time-wise within the transition period where a state has to say to a provider, there's no more, there's no more time left for you to make modifications. We need to reorient our focus to finding other alternatives, be it other providers, other funding sources, et cetera. Again, that's all gonna be very case specific, and that's not the goal, frankly. The goal is to avoid those conversations. The goal is to avoid that kind of disruption by having, having provider organizations do the changes um, that need to, to be done well in advance of the end of the transition period. So there's no guessing, there's no uncertainty as, as time is winding down. The lack of a pre-construction approval process prevents the flow of capital into needed infrastructure development. Can CMS develop some template or process by which uh, developers can get some sort of pre-approval or assurance that their, their setting will meet the settings mm -hmm. rule? That's a good question, and it goes back to references that you heard earlier about planned construction or, or new construction. Um, you know, we, we did um, start to receive from states uh, questions about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be breaking ground on this new, um, this new intentional community, a new cottage on the grounds of an ICF, what, what have you. And so this will require heightened scrutiny, and so I'm sending you information now about this setting so you can make a determination right now that it overcomes the presumption. And what we found was that that was actually quite difficult in the abstract. We were looking at blueprints for buildings. We were looking at bed size. We were looking at um, kind of proximate location of the physical footprint of the building to the rest of the community. Um, and that's, that's not really um, the, the nuts and bolts of the settings criteria. When you look at the criteria, it's how is the, what is the experience of individuals receiving services in a setting. And so that um, led to the, the creation of a document that's been on our website for a couple of years saying we really can't do that until we really can't make a determination that a presumptively institutional setting overcomes that presumption until there are Medicaid beneficiaries or people living in that uh, setting. We uh, have heard loud and clear the, the concerns about that and we don't, um, don't try to minimize them. Um, and so yeah. I honestly don't know what the next step is. We've been asked by stakeholders um, to, as we are re-looking at our heightened scrutiny guidance, we've been asked to take a look at how that impacts this guidance on new construction. And so we, the, the easy answer is we will be taking a look at that. What, what comes from that uh, other look, I, I don't know. That's, that's not been decided. Um, but we hear you on the concerns. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to convey any kind of conditional approval for CMS. It doesn't really exist in our world. Could it? Maybe. But those are some of the threads we need to pull. What kind of risk is there to a state, to a provider, to a builder, if we convey con uh, conditional approval and then something happens such that the, the <coughs> setting does not end up overcoming its institutional presumption? I think those are the scenarios we need to play out. So it's not a foregone conclusion that we will be taking another look at that. Uh, no. It's not a foregone conclusion that we will be changing that guidance. We, we will be um, taking a look at it and, and looking at it through the eyes of our uh, 2018 uh, heightened scrutiny guidance. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have now for questions, but Melissa, I think you're staying with us. Through, I am uh, staying. Tomorrow, right? uh, I'm staying today and tomorrow, and um, I don't know if my contact information is in any um, participant roster, but I'll, I'll give you my email. I ask you to be gentle uh, <laughs> as I give you my email, um, and, and some of my responses to you might be to link you with some of my colleagues, which I'm, I'm happy to do. Um, but uh, it's Melissa, M-E-L-I-S-S-A -S dot Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, at C-M-S 
.hhs.gov. So it's my first name, dot my last name, at cms.hhs.gov. And that's the typical email construct uh, for, uh, for CMS employees. And I assume you'll be willing to take questions throughout the day as, I will, as yes. time permits. I'll, but I'll, I will, I'll be around. Yeah, Thanks. would just ask folks to please be <laughs> respectful of Melissa's time in, uh, in asking your questions. Thank you. Thank you.